Okay, this is the last module for week eight. It's module four on confounding and interactions. So back again to our main categories of bias. We did selection bias, and we did information bias. And in this module, we're going to talk about confounding. And again, just to remind you of Grimes and Schultz's definition of bias, something quote-unquote different that's distorting the planned comparison. So what's confounding? Here we're basically asking, is there some extraneous factor that's blurring or marring or attenuating the relationship between the exposure that we've measured and the outcome? And in confounding, that happens because our exposure is associated with other factors that also influence the outcome. So as Rothman puts it, the effect of the exposure is mixed together with the effect of another exposure leading to bias. Grimes and Schultz call it a fly in the ointment. So there's a pretty precise definition of a confounder. Um, you can review this in Gordis if you need to. If you're trying to figure out whether factor A is a cause of disease B, then a third factor, which we'll call X here, is a confounder if two things are true. First of all, factor X has to be known to cause disease B. It has to be a known risk factor for the disease. And then it has to be associated with factor A, but not a result of factor A. So it isn't on the causal pathway from A to B. So let's talk about an example of that to make it as concrete as possible. So you have an observed association that you've uh, analyzed between coffee drinking and pancreatic cancer, and you want to know if it's causal. Well, there might be a confounder, and let's think about smoking as a confounder. So does it meet these two definitions, these two criteria of a confounder? Is it a known risk factor for pancreatic cancer? Yes, it is, and that's demonstrated by that arrow here. Is it associated with but not caused by coffee drinking? Yes, people who are more likely to smoke are also more likely to drink coffee, but neither one is causal uh, for the other. In that case, smoking is likely the relationship that we see to pancreatic cancer, but because smoking and coffee are associated, the observed relationship we see from coffee to pancreatic cancer is confounded by the presence of smoking. Let's do another one. Um, we see an observed association between IUD use and salpingitis, which is a fallopian tube inflammation or infection, I believe. And we do a two by two table. As we often do, our exposure here is IUD use, our disease status, yes or no. We have a bunch of people, and we calculate two different incidence rates. The incidence rate for IUD use is 4.5%. The incidence rate for no IUD use excuse me, is 1.5%. And we have a relative risk of 3.0. Looks like a very strong association. However, it turns out that a confounder in this case is number of sexual partners. So number of sexual partners is a known risk factor for salpingitis, and number of sexual partners is associated with, but not caused by, choice using an IUD for contraceptive purposes. So although we see the relationship here from IUD use to salpingitis, it's actually the confounder number of sexual partners. So what do we do if we suspect a confounder, how do we address it? Well, if it's still during the study design phase, a couple things you can do. You can restrict the study to only those who don't have the confounder, and then you know it's not a problem. You can actually match on confounder status um, so that people are matched with and without. Now, it's a possibility to randomize. One sort of assumes at this point in the study, if you're worried about the confounder, that it, you're worried because it's been an observational study. But if you have the luxury of randomizing your study, um, that actually will deal with any unknown confounders, because the only thing that should be different between your exposed and your unexposed group is your assignment of exposure. What about if it's after the fact and you've done your study and it's data analysis time? Well, the most common thing um, that's done, at least as a diagnostic, is to stratify by the confounder. So you're going to basically separate the group 
into those that have the confounder you're worried about and those that don't and see if the relationship holds. Another approach which we won't talk about in much detail here is just adjusting for the count confounder and I should have put adjust in quotes there because just throwing it into a regression model doesn't necessarily um, address the fact but you'll at least see if it meets the criteria for a confounder and if it changes the relationship. Apologies for the yawns, I'm recording this at 2 in the morning. Um, for uh, if adding the confounder to the model changes the relationship between your exposure of interest and your outcome. So how do we stratify? You're going to choose the potential confounder. You can do more than one, although doing them one at a time makes sense. And then within each stratum, you're going to both compute and then compare the stratum-specific measure of association that you're using in your study. And we'll walk through the same um, IUD example. So our confounder that we're concerned about is number of sexual partners and so we're going to divide the group into those that have had just one partner and those that have had more than one partner and then we're going to do the same analysis. So up at the top here's the folks with just one partner, IUD use yes or no, salpingitis yes or no, and interestingly the risk ratio is 1. So there is no relationship within the group of people who just have one partner between IUD use and salpingitis. Similarly, for the group that has more than one partner, uh, we can calculate relative risk. We can cal calculate incidence rate and relative risk, and it is also one. The fact that we get the same relative risk within strata, across strata, tells us that number of partners was confounding the relationship that we observed between IUD use and salpingitis. Now a couple other things you'll notice here once we've done our stratification. First of all, the prevalence of IUD use differs between our two strata. So in the one partner group, about 25% are using an IUD, whereas in our more than one partner group, about 88% are using an IUD. So we see here that IUD use and number of partners are associated. The other thing we see is that although our relative risk was 1 in each case, the incidence underlying those of salpingitis differs. So in our one partner group, our incidence is 1% of salpingitis, not differing by IUD use. And in our more than one partner group, the incidence is actually 6%. But again, it doesn't differ by IUD use. So this is where we can confirm that uh, number of partners is also a predictor of salpingitis. Another uh, type of relationship where our outcome is, is varying by different levels of uh, a, another factor in addition to our exposure of interest are interactions. And Gordas devotes a very long discussion with lots and lots of tables to this. Um, and I'm going to try to just present um, a piece of it. And if you want, want more information, you can dig more deeply um, into that chapter of Gordas. So Gordas describes it as when the incidence of disease in the presence of two or more risk factors differs from the incidence expected to result from their individual effects. So basically the, the effects are more than just the sum of the two parts, or in some cases the product of the two risk factors. Um, another way to think of it is when the effect of one risk factor on the outcomes varies across the levels of another factor. And another common name for this in the literature is effect modification, which you've probably heard of. So let's think about some known interactive effects um, or effect modification in the public health and epidemiological literature. So the effect of diabetes, for example, on the risk of coronary heart disease is stronger in women than in men. So if we had a two by two table of diabetes as our exposure and coronary heart disease as our outcome, we'd see a stronger association if we stratified by gender. Um, similarly, asbestos is a stronger risk factor for lung cancer if you're already a smoker than if you're a non-smoker. Cigarette smoking, a lot of these of course are about cancer. Um, cigarette smoking is a stronger risk factor for esophageal cancer in heavy drinkers than light drinkers. So in this case the smoking is interacting with alcohol use as a risk factor for esophageal cancer. Uh, the natural decline in lung function with aging is steeper for smokers than for non-smokers. So if you're looking at age as your exposure, 
lung function, decline of lung function as the outcome, smoking will, uh, is an interaction, is an interactive effect of smoking and aging. Um, HPV is more strongly associated with cervical cancer in women who are co-infected with HIV than in women without HIV infection. So across, ex across uh, exposure to HIV infection, the effect of HPV on cervical cancer incidence is different. So how do we detect effect modification? So the example we're going to walk through here is carotene intake uh, being an effect modifier of the association between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. So interestingly, one of the first things you're going to do is stratify exactly the same way we did to look for confounders. So I'm going to separate my participants here into non-smokers and heavy smokers and carotene intake being high, which is our risk, versus low, I'm sorry, which is uh, low is, is bad, is the risk, and carotene intake being high is good, um, and similarly within heavy smokers. And the measure I have for each of those four groups is incidence per 10,000. Now this to me is just crying out for a two by two table, so we're going to do that. Um, so again, here's my two, two by two table. Now instead of exposure and outcome, I've got the two different exposures that I'm interested in on the two different dimensions of my 2x2 two two table. And in each cell, I have the relevant lung cancer incidence per 10,000 for that group. Now, in order to test for, look for, diagnose an interactive effect or effect modifier, um, I have to decide ahead of time from theory or from prior empirical work whether I'm interested in an additive or a multiplicative model. Do I basically think these two effects are going to add together? Or do I think they're going to somehow multiply together? That if, uh, if one factor doubles the risk, that and another factor doubles the risk, that together they quadruple the risk um, versus just an additive model. For this example, I'm going to just say a priori that I'm interested in an additive model. And I'll show you what that means. So now I want to know whether the increase in incidence that I see with one factor actually depends on the level of the other factor. And that's fairly easy to do in this case if we think of an additive model. So let's look at the folks that are getting enough carotene right now. For the, the difference between those who are smoking and those who aren't smoking in terms of lung cancer incidence is about 74 cases per 10,000 among those who are getting carotene. Again, it's an additive model, so I'm looking at the difference between these two as opposed to the ratio. For those who are not getting enough carotene, which is our risk factor, the difference between lung cancer incidence among the non-smokers and the smokers is 568 cases per 10,000. So the answer uh, to the question, does incidence depend on, does, incidence, does the increase in incidence for one factor depend on the level of the other factor, clearly a yes. Um, there is an interaction here, um, an effect modifier between carotene intake and the effect of smoking on lung cancer incidence. So this produces, I think, some confusion often between what's a confounder and what's an effect modifier. And so I've put some distinctions here that will hopefully be helpful. In confounding, it's basically a nuisance problem. We're observing an association and it's gotten messed up by this presence of this other thing that we're actually not interested in um, that's making our relationship, it's uh, making a, a sort of a spur spurious relationship. And our analytic goal with a confounder is basically to control it so that we can eliminate it, to be aware of it, to factor it out, um, to sort of get rid of it. And the sort of tagline is guilt by association. So the exposure we were interested in is ending up looking guilty, looking like it's causing our outcome, only because this confounder is around. In contrast, the effect uh, modification, which is also sometimes called effect measure modification, just to make it longer and more complicated, is actually implying something about the mechanisms underlying the disease. It says that two things are actually operating here, and when they're together, they're operating differently from when they're operating separately. And here, with an effect modifier, our analytic goal is actually to describe it. We want to gain some insight into these mechanisms. And the tagline I like here is sort of conspiracy theory. We actually think think these two factors are working together somehow and we want to explain that relationship. 
Now, from an analytic standpoint, interestingly, we use stratification to diagnose those confounders or effect modifiers in both cases, but the ultimate goal is pretty different. Now, how do you know if your when you're doing your stratification if you've got a confounder or an effect modifier. So we saw two examples. Um, let's go back to those. With the, let's do the confounding first because that was the um, number of sexual partners and the IUD use in sulfangitis. So in that case we did stratum specific estimates and they were the same as each other meaning within across IUD use within number of sexual partners we saw similar um, incidence rates but those were both different from the incidence rates we'd calculated in the crude measure, meaning the unstratified measure. And that suggests to us the confounding is present. We also saw that there were different rates of IUD use for our, in our two different strata by number of sexual partners. In contrast, when we do, when we're looking for an effect modifier, do we see that the stratum specific estimates differ from each other? That's what we were looking for in the effect modification and analysis with carotene consumption and smoking. If that's the case, you found an effect modifier. Let's think about some implications of effect modifiers. So why do we look for those and, and how do they help us with this mechanistic understanding of the disease? Well, if you think about prevention efforts, your targeting of your prevention efforts at a population level are going to be very different if they're informed by effect modifiers. So if we think about lung cancer and dietary modification of carotene, we'd actually want to target that prevention program at the heavy smokers. And, con and also, if we want to target a uh, smoking cessation, that is going to have a bigger effect among folks who aren't getting their carotene than those who are. And here, as it summarizes the impact of dietary modification for non-smokers is going to be less. We're going to get bigger bang for the buck if we go after the heavy smokers to change their carotene intake than we would the non-smokers because of that different change in the risk of lung cancer uh, by carotene intake status. So what about at the individual level? Well, if we know there's an effect modifier, for example, if you're hep B positive, um, aflatoxin exposure um, is a worse risk factor for liver cancer than if you're not hep B positive. So if you're a clinician, you might want to look specifically uh, at you're going to be more paying more attention to happy positive people and making sure they're not getting exposed to aflatoxin than you would be to happy positive happy negative folks. Similarly, if you know um, that women uh, a woman carries the BRCA1 gene uh, and therefore is at higher risk for breast cancer, she you can counsel her more uh, to get more frequent mammograms, to do self-exams, whatever else you think will bring down her risk of breast cancer because she's um, got this effect modifier that her uh, her risk of, of breast cancer is going to be greater uh, than that that gene is going to amplify existing risks she has, so we need to be more careful with screening.